So I'm going to be discussing management of HCC in Africa, and as we'll see, in fact, we have really dismal outcomes. So I'm going to be looking briefly at the burden, management that we have, and what we have documented, and the importantly, prevention strategies. So as we know, HCC is the most common fatal malignancy in males and third in women in Africa. And according to the Global Burden of Disease Study in 2015, if we look at a combination of North Africa, Middle East, and Sub-Saharan Africa, there were 78,000 incident cases and 86,000 deaths. Clinically, males tend to predominate, the ratio of two to five being fold higher, particularly in hepatitis B-related HCC. And socioeconomically, it tends to affect more rural populations and urban. And if we look at the median age in sub-Saharan Africa, particularly in relation to hepatitis B, this is about 45 years. But interesting, if you are rural born and living, uh, living black male, the median uh, age is 34.7. But interesting, as you move and migrate to the cities in early childhood, the median age rises to just under 51 years. And this is similar to those who are born in cities and remain in cities, suggesting that there is an environmental component. And we need to remember this is an aggressive tumor with coexisting cirrhosis and only about 60%. And as we've seen, HCC incidence matches mortality. So the risk factors are very well known to us. Hepatitis B, we need to always remember the cofactor of hepatitis D, which tends to present a much more aggressive early onset um, HCC. And we need to remember this in terms of screening. Hepatitis C, exposure to dietary aflatoxin, and alcohol-induced cirrhosis. Other important cofactors are dietary overload, and I think we mustn't forget the entity now of NAFLD associated with obesity, diabetes, insulin resistance, either as its own entity in causing HCC, but as an important cofactor, and we're seeing this increasingly in urban individuals with chronic hepatitis B. So we look at the age standardized incidence ratios, mortality ratios, and age standard DALIs. The highest is in West Africa with 29,000 incident cases, 31,000 deaths, and we look at DALIs per 100,000, it's 1,000. If we look, comparing it to the rest in North Africa, age standard incidence ratio is 6.3, 16.9 in Central Africa, 10.3 in East Africa, and 8.6 in Southern Africa. And the age standard mortality per 100,000 in North Africa is 7.1, 19.9 in Central Africa, and in East Africa 11.9, and in Southern Africa 9.5. And we need really to remember the really significant morbidity associated with this. So the age standard DALIs in North Africa is 159, in Central Africa 460, East Africa 306, and in Southern Africa 218. And if we look at the incident ratio across all regions, it's more common in men than in women, and it ranges from five to two per one, with the higher prevalence in males being particularly in hepatitis B associated. As is expected, the incident ratio is high as due to mainly due to hepatitis C in North Africa and Middle East, in Western Sub-Saharan Africa due to hepatitis B, in Central Africa, hepatitis C. And interestingly, recent data show that in both Eastern and Southern Sub-Saharan Africa, the highest incident ratio is actually related to alcohol. So we look at the overall contribution of hepatitis B, C, alcohol, and other causes on absolute liver cancer death in both sexes, as was recently reported. Globally, hepatitis B accounts for 33%. As can be expected in North Africa and Middle East, hepatitis C is 44%. Hepatitis B accounts for 45% in Western Sub-Saharan Africa, and hepatitis C, 37% in Central Africa. And then we look in Eastern Africa, 32% is due to alcohol, and 42% are due to Southern Africa. So we look at this majority is doing hepatitis B, C, alcohol. These are either entirely preventable, treatable, or modifiable with lifestyle um, adaptations. Uh, this graph shows really the severe morbidity and mortality associated in West Africa, with Gambia actually leading the problem. Globally, at country level, hepatitis B accounted for the largest contribution to liver cancer mortality in the Gambia at 60%. So what data do we actually have available? As we know, liver cancer registries are not very common. They're not very well um, adapted. And so we need, the most of the data that we've got comes from the Africa Liver Consortium. 
looked at nine countries and 21 referral centers, and those are colored in green. There were 2,500 patients, 1,200 from Egypt, and, and 1,300 from, nine, from the nine sub-Saharan countries. But one of the problems, as you can see, there are no southern African countries represented. So over a 10-year period, they describe the demographics, clinical features, management, and outcomes, and we've got a lot to learn from the study. So the overall meeting age was 54 years. In Egypt, as we expected, we was mainly due to hepatitis C, it was 58 years, and sub-Saharan Africa, 46 years. HCV accounted for 84% in Egypt, and hepatitis B, 55% in sub-Saharan Africa. And the median age was higher in those with hepatitis C associated at 58 years, compared to 42 years for those with hepatitis B. But the real concerning data that came out was access to specific therapy. In Egypt, 76% had access, but only 3% in sub-Saharan Africa. And this, as can be expected, had an effect on the median overall one-year survival. In Egypt, it's just only 11 months, but in sub-Saharan Africa, we have a dismal two and a half month survival. So this really looks at how, why the survival is so poor. In sub-Saharan Africa, from the same study, 72% presented with Barcelona stage D, and only 5% in stage A to B. And if you compare this to the European data, 14% will present with the terminal stage D, and 40% in stage A to stage B. If we look at the options that were available in Egypt, bearing in mind 76% had some access to specific therapy, in terms of curative treatment, 35% had access. And if we look at this in more breakdown, less than 1% was actually transplantation, despite having access to established transport programs, 2% resection, 32% local radiofrequency ablation, 36% TES, and 5% serafinib. <clears throat> and as we can see, really many, very few patients had access to any therapy in the other countries in sub-Saharan Africa. So if we look at the overall survival according to stage, if you were stage A to B, there was really no difference between Egypt and other sub-Saharan countries, really driving the, our need to actually identify these patients early. Survival, however, was much worse in sub-Saharan African countries, in those presenting with stage C with a hazard ratio of 2, stage D with a hazard ratio of 3.3, and if the stage was unknown, the hazard ratio was as high as 5.96. So what are the reasons for the median age of HC diagnosis being younger in sub-Saharan countries, 46 compared to 58? Is there a role of environmental, biologic, or genetic factors? Or is it relating to the majority due to hepatitis B? And as we know, in early childhood, we have incorporation of the hepatitis B genome into the hepatocyte genome and the risk of pro-oncogenesis. So what were the factors that were independently associated with poor survival, obviously living in the sub-Saharan Africa compared to in Egypt, the presence of hepatic encephalopathy, <clears throat> the tumor size, level of the alpha feed protein, and importantly, performance status, and no specific therapy. Tumor size information increased the chance of, survive, of receiving treatment with an odds ratio of 2.3, and was associated with a better overall survival with a hazard ratio of 0.83. But of concerning, in 62% of sub-Saharan countries, tumor size was not available. And this probably relates both to lack of access to sophisticated imaging, but also patients presenting pre-terminal. So how are we going to present these clinical presentations of aggressive tumor presented late with this triad of abdominal pain, swelling, and jaundice, which we see throughout in many countries in West Africa, but also in South Africa? In terms of trying to predict, uh, can we use the models that predict hepatitis B-related uh, HCC development? These have been developed in Asia and in Europe, and in fact, none of these have been validated in Africa. We need to remember they are weighted for age and cirrhosis, and importantly, that 40% of liver cancer occurs in young, non-cirrhotic hepatitis B patients in sub-Saharan Africa. So we need to be looking at developing our own risk models. <clears throat> in terms of screening and surveillance programs of alpha feed protein and ultrasound every six months in high-risk individuals, as we know, this enables <clears throat> sorry, early detection and improves overall survival. But if we're going to have this, we have to have adequate recall policies. We need programs for this. But once you identify them and diagnose it, you need to have access to a therapy that actually can reduce mortality and morbidity. So once again, we need to look at guidelines that are relevant to North Africa and those that are relative to Sub-Saharan Africa. This 
um, slide clearly shows the benefits of survival um, surveillance programs in Taiwan and, Taiwan and Japan, which actually significantly improve survival. And then there's really poor survival figures in Africa relating to this major surveillance gap and lack of early diagnosis as a result of screening. This web-based study was recently reported by Lewis Roberts at the Gaslit Meantech in August this year. And they looked at 14 African countries, 58 referral centers, and they looked at 50, 63 participants. Of note, this were representations from West, Central, East, and Southern Africa. And what is concerning, 76% reported that less than 10% of patients were under surveillance at the time of diagnosis of HCC. 62% reported that hepatitis B was diagnosed before HCC diagnosis in less than 10%. And what were the barriers to HCC surveillance? 90% reported lack of liver disease diagnosis, nearly 60% lack of symptoms, once again emphasizing the need for education that viral hepatitis is usually a clinically silent disease, even by the time they develop compensated cirrhosis. And 44% claim poverty was one of the reasons. So what were the available treatment options? In fact, these were not too bad. Surgery was available in 56%, local ablation of 37%, and local regional therapy of 30%. So why were patients not accessing the therapy in sub-Saharan Africa? Once again, the main reason was patients presenting at advanced stage in 98%, poverty in 60%, and then lack of clinical expertise in 57%. And this really addresses our need to establish centers of excellence. And I think we need to look in a region where hepatitis B is endemic, whether we should be looking at population-based screening in order to identify candidates for HCC surveillance. So this diagnostic algorithm is really well known to all of us. But underpinning this, diagnosis requires access to sophisticated imaging, but you also experience radiologists that are trained in interpreting difficult um, <coughs> imaging. So in terms of management, <coughs> as we know, management ultimately depends on access to healthcare. We have 27 low-income countries, and if we look at the access to surgical care, this is 0.7 in low-income and 5.5 in low-middle-income countries, and this contrast of 22.6 and 56.9 per 100,000 in upper-middle-income and high-income countries, respectively. As we've seen, stage is important, but importantly, performance status. So as we know, the curative options are local ablation, resection, liver transplantation, palliative, test, systemic therapies, and importantly, best supportive care. And I think what we'll see, I think what we need to be really concentrating in many of our regions is prevention strategies. So in terms of the access to therapy, if we're looking at trying to attempt survival greater than five years, we're looking at ablation, resection, and transplantation. But I think for the majority of countries, we should be concentrating on detecting early so we can offer ablation and resection. In terms of more palliative therapy and chemoembolization systemic therapy, we need to identify patients who are suitable for this, and we need to improve access. But importantly, you also need to be able to provide best supportive care so patients presenting late can actually die of dignity, and as we'll show, that this is actually not happening in many of our countries. So we look at the global health estimate in terms of what was the estimated need for surgery. The highest rates in this recent estimate were in Western, Central, and Eastern Sub-Saharan Africa, and this correlates with the high incidence of HCC. A recent online survey done by our hepatitis steroids and our unit in Cape Town, looking at a few countries outside, sub outside South Africa, and they established that there were hepatobiliary surgeons in 13 tertiary centers, and they looked at Nigeria, Senegal, Ghana, Cameroon, Kenya, Uganda, Namibia, and Zimbabwe, and we need to build on this expertise. In terms of liver transplantations, we have established centers in Egypt and South Africa, there's some in Tunisia, and those that are planning programs include Sudan and Ghana. But I think we also need to be able to train individuals in how to manage patients post-transplant. As has been mentioned, many patients do go overseas to have living related and then return, and then return to individuals who do not know how to manage transplantation long term. So unfortunately, there is limited access to sophisticated diagnostic imaging, the lack of trained interventional radiologists for RFA and TESS, and we need to be addressing this. In terms of targeted therapies, 
in terms of serafinib, and uh, we know that the outcomes were not as good in Asia as in Europe, and in fact none of those trials were ever done in Africa, as similarly can be said for lafenib and the second line therapy, roganofenib. And in fact, in reality, most of our patients would not get access to these therapies. But I think what's concern, as we've seen that the HSC burden is significant in Africa, but only 1% of current ongoing clinical trials are actually being conducted in Africa, and this is something that we should be changing. In terms of palliative therapy, 95% of patients in that Africa Liver Consortium study were treated with palliative intent. And if we look at the sub-Saharan countries who have access to oral morphine, these are in pink and green. In fact, this is very few. And this is due to regulatory restrictions, lack of healthcare training in terms of opioids for palliation, and then this ongoing opioid phobia in terms of side effects and addiction. And this is a real concern as at least 88% of cancer deaths who moderate to severe pain are being untreated appropriately. So we need to look at a resource-sensitive approach, and we need to recognize that resources differ within and between countries. In terms of mineral resources, which apply to many regions within my own country in South Africa, we don't have many treatment options available, and we really should be looking at primary and secondary prevention. In terms of medium resources, resection and ablation, and higher resources, liver transplantation is really realistic and you're going to be available to a few patients. So we need to look at primary and second prevention, and we need to improve access to hepatobiliary surgery and interventional radiology. So these prevention strategies, I think we need to really realize that many of these diseases are highly preventable or curable. The primary prevention targets in terms of the sustainable development goals as well as the WHO strategies look at eliminating viral hepatitis as a major public health threat. So we need to look at active hepatitis immunization, implementing the birth dose, full universal vaccination. And as we've heard from a number of speakers today, adults do present with acute hepatitis B. So we need to be looking at vaccinating high-risk groups. We need to improve safe injection and transfusion practices and avoidance of unnecessary parental treatments. Importantly, we need to decrease aflatoxin exposure. We need to reduce the harmful use of alcohol and tobacco and importantly, control diabetes and obesity. But once again, as we've seen from a number of the talks today, we need to actually address community and patient education programs regarding the risk factors for viral hepatitis, aflatoxin and associated liver disease, and healthy lifestyle options. So this slide was shown yesterday by Shravanti, showing that the systemic review at an earlier age of infection not only is associated with an increased probability of chronic hepatitis B, but an increased risk of HCC. And a longitudinal study from the Gambia showed that hepatitis B was a risk factor for significant fibrosis and HCC. So we really need to be addressing this. As has been shown very clearly in Taiwan, the implementation of a very active hepatitis B vaccination was able to decrease the HCC incidence by 10, 10 to the 5 person years from 0.92 in unvaccinated to 0.23 in vaccinated cohorts. In terms of global and regional vaccination, we are only sitting at 77 and we need to improve this to 90%. And this is important because Taiwan studies have shown that incomplete vaccination is an important predictor for HCC with a hazard ratio of 2.52 after correction for maternal surface antigen status. Prevention strategies in terms of aflatoxin control, we need to remember that aflatoxin and hepatitis B has synergistic hepatocarcinogenic effects with a relative risk of 54 with dual exposure. And it's importantly, when one addresses both routes of contamination, both growth and storage, one needs to look at replacing crops with those that are less susceptible to aflatoxin, as has been actively done in China, with replacing with a rice-based diet. We need to educate individuals and communities that damaged plants are more susceptible to fungal contamination. We need to look at pre-harvest prevention of adequate irrigation and use of fungicides, and actually educate in terms of removing uh, moldy crops. Importantly, improve storage facilities, and this is relevant because if you can decrease the aflatoxin exposure to below detectable levels, this decreases the HC incidence in the general population by 14 to 90 percent, and the surface antigen population as high as 30 percent. So in terms of second prevention, as we've seen repeatedly throughout the last two days, treatment of hepatitis B and C is essential. This decreases the HCC risk, including those of advanced fibrosis, even leading to regression. 
But once again, you're going to need to diagnose these individuals and link them to care. And that means we need access to affordable WHO pre-qualified point of care di diagnostics, as well as <coughs> DNA monitoring. We need to look at how we can then implement screening and surveillance of high-risk populations. And importantly, I think we need to be establishing centers of excellence for HCC management within our countries, which can act as referral centers. So we see in the slide, we know that in Tecavir, compared with controls, improves outcomes in terms of HCC in cirrhotic patients, with the cumulative HCC incidence rates at five years being 3.7% in Tecavir and 13.7% in controls. In fact, we're not really doing very well in Africa. The recent Polaris Observatory study showed of 78 million estimated to be infected, only 1.5 million were diagnosed, or 2%. And of the 21 million that were eligible for treatment, in fact, we've only treat, estimated we've only treated about 33,000, or less than 1% access therapy. So we need to be working on this if we're going to establish this target of treating 1 million by 2020. In terms of hepatitis C and secondary prevention, this large retrospective card study of 22,000 patients treated with DAAs from the Veteran Health Administration hospitals, they had 271 new cases and 181 with an SVR. But the SVR significantly reduced the HCC from 0.9 compared to 3.5 HCC per 100 person years, with an adjusted hazard ratio of 0.28. And as can be expected, cirrhotics had the highest annual HCC incidence after SVR at 1.82 versus 0.3 per 100,000 person years in non cirrhotics So once again, we need to remember these patients need to be in long-term follow-up with ongoing surveillance, and we need to put these programs in place. But once again, we're not doing very well in terms of actually accessing hepatitis C therapy. In North Africa, the strides have been enormous. They've got a 6% positive net cure, so they're addressing the epidemic. But in sub-Saharan Africa, as I showed earlier, it's minus 2.1, so we are having more infections than cures, and we need to look at how we're going to access affordable diagnostics, but also affordable, probably, pangenotypic regimens for this management. Tertiary prevention is only going to be applicable to a few patients, probably, but I think we need to remember that we need to continue therapy. The systemic review, meta-analysis, meta antiviral therapy, reduce HCC recurrence after curative surgery, and this is going to be very important as we identify more individuals and get them into appropriate therapy. And this shows there's an improvement in recurrence-free survival in the antiviral group with a hazard ratio of 0.66, and an improvement in overall survival as well with a hazard ratio of 0.56. The nationwide claim database from Taiwan showed that antivirals were independently associated with reduced risk of HCC recurrence after surgical resection and radiofrequency ablation. So what can we learn from our own <coughs> continent? Well, the prolific project which reduced the incidence of hepatitis, which aims to reduce the incidence of hepatitis B-related HCC in West Africa. They've been able to validate three point of care rapid diagnostic tests, both in the field and laboratory settings upscaling diagnosis and linkage to care. And as we've heard um, this morning, both in the Western Cape and Namibia, they're actually validating point of care rapid diagnostic tests. The Prolifica project also showed that large scale test and treat to HV programs are feasible and cost effective. And they validated a urinary metabolite panel that has a high sensitivity of 86% and specificity of 90% in discriminating HCC from cirrhosis and diagnostically outperform the serum alpha feeder protein. So I think we need to learn from these projects that are ongoing, successful, and apply them to our own regions. So in summary, if we look at the management of HCC, I think we need to be looking at a public health approach for primary prevention, and this will remain the cornerstone of management of HCC in sub-Saharan Africa. But HCC does fulfill the criteria for a successful surveillance program. It enables earlier diagnosis for a curable HCC, and as we see, we do have centers that can offer curative therapy. Improved surveillance will require recall uh, policies, but importantly, once you've diagnosed, recalled them, we need to be able to do something. So we need to have point-of-care viral testing, diagnostic imaging, interventional radiology, curative surgery, and importantly, palliative interventions. So I think we need to develop adaptable resource centers of HCC guidelines for Africa, and importantly, we need to establish HCC registry so we know that what is going on within our own continent. And importantly, we need to develop centers of excellence within African countries which can act as academic training centers and can be sites for clinical trials. Thank you very much.